Ask any foreigner around about what they think of the Philippines and its citizens, the Filipinos, and you'll get stereotypical responses like, Oh, they're good in English, or Spanish, or Chinese. How about no? What else? Dog meat is regularly eaten. Again, no. Philippines has a small portion of its industry catering to dog meat, most of them in cities like Baguio, due to its cold weather as some people claim dog meat makes them warm. And the majority frown upon this practice as much as the rest of the world. In fact, their government is constantly battling the trade of dog meat. Philippines is actually a dog-friendly country. Contrary to people's opinion, most of the Filipino household has at least one dog pet in them so stop saying they normally eat dogs. They really don't. Let's list down more. Filipinos are uneducated. Filipinos are always late. Philippines is such a dangerous country. What else? All Filipinos are maids. Yes. How many times have you read a foreign book about a Filipino maid entering the room or cleaning the bathroom? Looking back at all these negative stereotypes of the Philippines makes you wonder. How did they end up here? How true is the Spaniards' claim that if Magellan didn't accidentally stumble upon their little island, riffling through their land for those little chilies, that the Philippines would have remained uncivilized? One of the most misguided notions about pre-colonial Philippines is the idea that they did not have a culture before Spaniards came to conquer them. Tribes were considered uncivilized and unsystematic. Paganism and Islam were the dominant religions in the country. It was the Spaniards, with their modernized and refined religion, that gave them their culture. Eradicating most of the pre-colonial archives that they considered barbarian, the Filipino identity was defined again and again by its continuous servitude to other foreign countries such as Spain, America, and Japan. In order for us to know the Filipino identity, Let's go back to pre-colonial times, starting with the social hierarchies. There were no executives, legislative, or judicial department as we know of their democratic system today. Communities were called tribes, headed by a datu, or sultan. They hold the highest position in the tribe. How can one become a datu? Well, you need to possess outstanding bravery, intelligence, and of course, wealth. A datu or sultan's power is signified by the amount of gold, land, and slaves he has. There was no democracy then, only rigid authority. Next to the datu or sultan are the maharlika and timawa. Maharlikas are the datu's aid in keeping the barangay organized and planned. You can think of the datu as our modern-day president and maharlikas as the president's soldiers. They fight to keep the datu in position and as compensation, they were not required to pay their taxes. You just need to be brave, tough, and well-versed in fighting. However, if you're not interested in fighting, such as this narrator, perhaps you can be a Timawa instead. I know, we use this word as a kind of insult nowadays, but believe me, we are all Timawa. The Timawas are what can be called the free men. They are mostly merchants who are allowed to own private properties but are still required to pay their taxes, just like us in this democratic country. The last in this social hierarchies are the slaves called Alipin. Their duty is to serve the Datu or the Maharlikas, who are considered Alipin, those that committed crimes and whose lands were taken over by the Datus, or those that were orphaned and have no family to care for them anymore. The Alipin could be categorized into two. The Aliping Namamahay and the Aliping Sagigilid. Aliping Namamahay are slaves that have their own houses and are allowed to own private properties while still serving their datu. In contrast, Aliping Sagigilid are those that need to be by the datu's side day and night and are not allowed to have their private properties. Well, in today's context, Aliping Namamahay are those stay-out housemates that we have and the Sagikilid are those that live by their boss so they can respond to their tasks more efficiently. Except modern-day housemaids have more rights and privileges than the Alipins before. So what does our political system look like during pre-colonial Philippines? A barangay is composed of at least 30 to 100 families 
with Datu as the head. There are two types of laws a Datu can make with his advisors, one written and the other verbal. Written laws are then disseminated among families by someone called Umaluhokan. They stand in front of the barangay and read the laws for everyone to comply with. Just like our modern day announcers, except we do it now via televisions and radio stations. There's also a judicial system dedicated to those who wronged the Datu or broke the law. They would go through hearing in front of the tribe that would determine if they committed a crime. Most criminals would either be demoted to slavery or killed. And just like in Game of Thrones, an accused could opt to go through challenges believed to be sacred. If they live before these challenges, then they're innocent. And if not, then God willed them to die. However, pre-colonial communities are not just about brutal territorial disputes and slavery. Datus are also known for forming alliances with other barangays. They do this through blood compact called Sanduguan, where two Datus cut their wrists then mix their blood drops with a cup of wine. Drinking from this cup signifies eternal camaraderie that is unbreakable by anything unless through divine intervention. And they will look for one piece and become the king of the pirates. Let's move on to Philippines pre-colonial literature. Most of the Philippines' literature then were purely oral in tradition, meaning they were performed and recited by someone while the village listened. These stories are called epics. Pre-colonial epics, also called ethno-epic, is defined by E. Arsenio Manuel to be a narrative of sustained length based on oral tradition revolving around supernatural events or heroic needs in the form of verse which is either chanted or sung with a certain seriousness of purpose, embodying or validating the beliefs, customs, and ideals of life values of the people. Isagani Cruz, a Filipino writer and scholar, enumerated a morphology of the Philippine epic. The hero leaves home. The hero acquired the use of a magical agent. The hero is transferred, delivered, or led to the whereabouts of an object. The hero starts a battle. The hero fights for a long time. A god or goddess comes and stops the fight. She reveals that the hero and the enemy are related by blood. Hero dies, resurrects, returns home and gets married. Sounds familiar? Yes, it's the same concept used in famous Filipino TV shows like Ang Pandai and Enteng Kabisote. We can even trace it back to some of Philippines national events. If we take for example Ninoy Aquino's fight against the Marcos administration, he did indeed leave the country and came back as a hero. Philippines history is defined by death and rebirth. Cruz remarked that death and resurrection is a strong Filipino tenet and provided an easier access for Spaniards to, to infiltrate the heart of Filipino people by using the narrative of Jesus. He discerned the resemblance of Jesus' story to that of an ethno-epic hero. Even in today's times, Morphology remains to be the true in observance to modern Filipino heroes, such as Cardo in FPJ's Ang Provinciano. The Filipino audience continues to be drawn to this idea of a hero, unstoppable and untouchable by entities. This extends even to their idea of a seamless political figure. Aspiring political candidates clamor for a story of that of a person who came from desolate hardships and is able to defeat corruption or a dominant international figure. Furthermore, such figures are also paired with an ideal partner to complete the image of a Filipino hero. How about the women in pre-colonial times? How did the society treat them? Women in pre-colonial Philippines played a critical role in the community, both in political and religion matters. Unlike the churches predominantly led by men that we now have, it was the women who led rituals before. They were called Babaylans. The Datu sought political advice from them especially during wars, where they were believed to possess the ability to perceive the chances of their Datu winning the fights. They also enjoyed freedom and rights that were denied to women during colonization such as rights to own private properties, sell their own goods, become the next Datu if there's no son available, freedom to choose their husbands, and divorce if they preferred. Virginity was not a requirement for girls to be respected. Even males who were effeminate were allowed to marry another man. If an effeminate male has been determined to have a potential in becoming a babaylan, 
he would be raised as a woman. In choosing his husband, strong soldiers will fight amongst themselves and the winner gets the right to marry him. Sounds like pre-colonial Philippines are more accepting to LGBTQ communities than now, right? So, what do you think about the pre-colonial Philippines? Would you want to live in this time? Comment down below and let us know your thoughts about this video. Thank you.